Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time to look at what the national dailies are saying this morning. And we have a guest to review the papers for us. We have Ezekiel Inia Etok, a public affairs analyst, joining us from Aquarium this morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Yes, yes. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Compliments of the season. Merry Christmas to the Plus TV family and everybody. Yay. Okay, you too, you too, you too. <laughs> so, okay, let's go right into the papers this morning. Um, the major headline, we're starting with the punch, the major headline here and on most of all the papers that we have, it says Ayadati Wa takes over. That's on punch. Tinubu governor say Akara Dulu's death big loss. The writer on this one is Ayadati Wa lists Akara Dulu's achievements. This is governor's aides resign. Workers mourn. Akara Dulu, a great fighter, says Tinubu governors, others, and Ondo declares a three day mourning. So this. Um, this is coming from Ondo states. Most of the papers we have this morning are talking about the death of governor. Our, um, Rotimi Akaradulu. What do you have to say on all of this? It's quite a big loss, <coughs> but I want to hear from you. Okay. First, um, my condolences to his immediate family. Yes. On those states and Nigeria at large, generally. And um, a lot has been said about Mr. Akaradulu on account of how he was a man that believed in certain ideologies and lived those ideologies. A man that was very bold, a man that was very audacious. As a former president of NBA, and when you know how NBA is structured, it means a man is a man of substance, and then eventually came to become the governor of one of those states. And um, somewhere along the line, uh, what happens to virtually every mortal happens to him. I'm talking about his health. Yeah. And um, it ended yesterday. Um, yes, I think it was yesterday uh, when he passed. Mm -hmm. And um, so that much, I would say. Um, but for me, the takeaways are very many. One is that for us to progress as a people, because this has happened too many times, the people of Ondo State have lost quality governance because we have over-personalized governance. And the governor becomes the owner of the state. It's an ideology that we must radically depart from. We must come to a point where the state is not the governor and the governor the state. I believe that whenever the time comes that a governor is seemingly incapacitated, we must put certain laws in place where he transmits power and then such transmission is not subject to his whims and caprices, what he thinks, he doesn't think. No, there should be something extremely decisive about it. For instance, if for any reason you cannot assume normal official duties for a period not exceeding one month, you must, or for a period exceeding one month, you must, by constitution, hand over power because the state cannot be run by proxy. Right. Number two, the place of the deputy governor must be looked at decisively. And I would like to take a little time here because, you know, I have contested the governorship and the processes of getting a deputy, people don't know. Number one is that the party wants to give you your deputy. But there's a reason why the Constitution asks you to choose your deputy. The deputy is never contested for. Mm. It's at the call of the governor because there is an intentment. The governor, if he means well, is supposed to, like marrying a wife, look for that lady that 
he is compatible with mm. to look for that lady that he trusts, to look for that lady that he knows is the left hand of his right hand, and that the, the two arms, they will complement each other, and he will be able to deliver the mandate for which the people had entrusted him. Now, instead of that being the case, people forced on governor, deputies, for two reasons. They know that he's a satire, but they want, thank you for the lovely salute, <laughs> they want somebody that will succeed the governor. And as a result, instead of a deputy being a compliment, it becomes a threat. That is why most governors make their deputies as useless as Dodo. So for me, I want to make a very, very, very decisive recommendation. No deputy should succeed a governor. What that means is that if you are a deputy governor, you cannot be part of the next electoral process, except the governor is going for a second term and he is bringing you along for the second term. But outside of that, you cannot be, you cannot contest an election in the next season. You must keep one season. Now, the prognosis, or the, what, what this prognosticates is that as a deputy governor, you know that you cannot have an ambition of succeeding your boss. So you become your boss's companion and not competitor, and sometimes somebody who even works against the interests of the governor. I think this is one point that the nation should look at very seriously. As a governor, as a deputy governor, you must, except you are carried along for a second term, you must keep the next electoral cycle before you can contest again. So you know that you are going in for something to work with your governor and not an eye on the seats of your governor. Mm. That is one thing. The second thing I want to look at, just two things I want to look at in terms of on those days. One is the deputy governor stuff, which I've said. The second is the health status. Mm. I'm not talking age. It was the mandatory obligatory that you publicly disclose your age status if you want to be a governor a deputy governor, a vice president, a president. You must publicly declare your health status. I say this because, by the grace of God, I just turned 60. But I want to say publicly that the last time I spent one night in a hospital was in 1985. One night in a hospital was in 1985. So you can be 60, you can be 65, and you are very fit and you are very fine, and you can be 35, mm. and your body functions are not in place. True. You are obese, you don't take care of yourself, you are not fit. So I'm not talking age now, I'm talking health status. Mm. You must declare it publicly. When we have those two things in place, we may start to have a system that we don't get into the, what we had to do with Yara Twa or with Ashkari Dulu or with so many other people in the past. Okay, well, um, we just uh, wish him, uh, we pray uh, for the repose of his soul. And uh, we also pray that uh, Ayeze Tiwa uh, will do the right thing because he is under pressure, he's going to be under pressure. And a lot of people say that the shoes of Akeridolu are very, very large for him to fill. But uh, let him do his best for the interest of Ondo people and uh, for posterity's sake. Still on the Punch newspaper, we have a story that is saying railway debt servicing exceeds... Your permission, I will say something. Okay, just briefly. Okay. I want it to be known that the people of Ondo State went to the polls to vote for the program, the manifesto of the governor that has just passed. 
and that it was a joint ticket for the manifesto that the people voted for. As a result, though he has become, uh, Mr. Lockyer has become a governor, he cannot jettison the program that the people voted for. He is brought in to conclude the program that the people voted for. I'm talking this, you know, constitutionally and foundationally. The people of Ondo State had several people that provided, you know, uh, manifestos to them. They looked at all and said, we like the manifesto of Mr. Atkerodon. So they have brought two people, the governor, the deputy governor, for that program. Now, in the absence of the, dep of the governor, the deputy governor is mandated, it is obligatory, it is incumbent upon him to continue the program that the people voted for. He cannot have his independent program. Yeah, he has said so, that he's going to complete all those projects that yeah. were started. I do hope that uh, in this interregnum, in this uh, little time where we, we didn't know what was going on in Ondo State, I hope that some things were not approved mm. without the approval of the governor. Because right. we, we've seen uh, forging of signatures and all those kind of things. There are some things that may have been done that are outside that manifesto that the governor will come and not do, and then the people will say, okay, you are digressing from what was agreed. But he has promised to uh, complete ev everything they had started with his principal, who is now deceased, and we hope that he will continue in that trajectory. Um, so uh, the next um, top uh, um, headline yes. uh, is uh, uh, federal government, no, not that. The railway, the railway debt servicing exceeds revenue by 1,200%. That is according to the report that we have seen. And then the same railway is the one that has been asked uh, uh, to carry people for free for the period from now till uh, uh, 4th of January. And they were complaining before now that uh, what they had done before this time, when the government told them uh, to do such a thing, they had not been refunded. So. I don't know how they're going to survive or how that sector is going to be. You, you, you see, we have um, a governance that we really don't appreciate the fundamentals of governance. We can do all this analysis for as long as we wish. But the fact remains that unless we come to no government for what it is and appreciate it for what it is, We'll just be doing governance on the line with the rules. You cannot make a policy statement without first thinking through it. Thinking through it does not need, you, see, you know, I don't know how to put this. Any phone that you have was researched upon about 10 years ago before it comes out. Ask anybody. Almost the same thing with any medicine that we take. There is a bathroom that does the research and it comes out after several tests and scenarios. As we are today, the government should have a back room that says what happens if Cameroon opens the dam? What will happen? What happens if there's a coup in Cameroon? What happens if if the, the, the Americans come to set up a business, they have so many global issues that they have scenarios A, B, C. That's a back room. That is government. They think ahead, forward thinking. Now we are here. By the time a governor makes or a president makes a statement, the back room has already done a synthesis of that scenario, done the cost analysis. It becomes a project when you have a timeline, you have the cost, you have the deliverables. These are the basics. So before a policy is made, there is already the foundation laid. It's like a rail line. Before you buy the coaches, the tracks have already been laid. 
But we have a situation where government makes a statement and then goes back to think. You are asking people to write free. They'll clap for you. Fantastic, but for goodness sake. When you look at the real way, the way you operate, you have one, two, three arms. One arm is salaries and wages. One arm is maintenance. One arm is other overhead. And then you now think in terms of profit. Before profit, all this, what is the aggregate monthly cost of all this? And what provision have you made for them in the next two months like you projected? When you do that, you call the management, you give them your position on it and give them the instruction. You call the finance. Uh, the ministry and central bank to make these provisions available to them so that there is a seamless operation and transition. That is the way it ought to have been. Then you'll be shocked, you'll be shocked, and I stand to be corrected, to hear that the head of the Nigerian Railways heard this in the news, like everybody heard, and it's like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know? So I, I, I think that we should start to run government as a serious business and not as politics. Politics and governance are two lines that don't need their parallel line. That's what I can say about that. All right. Let's go into um, something else which talks about insecurity, economic hardship to worsen in six states. And this is coming from the World Bank. I'm sure you you live here in Nigeria, you know what's happening. You've heard of the killings that happen in Plateau State. So we're talking about insecurity and we're also talking about economic hardship to worsen in six states. And if they're saying to worsen, I would think we're already in the deep at the moment. So if they say to worsen, does it mean that's this scary. is that's it's scary? Scary. scary? Does it mean it's going to get worse than what we are currently facing <laughs> at this point? But I just want to get your thoughts quickly on this one. So the World Bank has said insecurity, economic hardship to worsen in six states. Okay. Um, unfortunately for me, I don't know what happened. I didn't get um, okay. some of the things, a lot of the things to say. But your account is low. Let me just take that again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Okay, so I think there's a little bit of a, of a um, technical glitch, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared at this the, point. The, I don't know why, why the World Bank will say six states out of 36. So 30 states will be comfortable or what? Because I think... If it's going to affect six states, it's going to affect like everybody. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the insecurity at the same scale, but yes. the economic hardship is going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. You would expect somewhere like Abuja or Lagos not to experience this, but we're exper experiencing this even more. I think everybody in Nigeria states. is experiencing economic yeah. hardship. I am. I can tell you my bank account is, <laughs> is experiencing economic hardship. But if they seem to worsen, I think mm. that's the one that's scary for me. It's really scary. Because... Uh, Everybody's facing the same thing, I want to believe. But sometimes, sometimes the projections of the World Bank and other people uh, may not be true. Mm. I'm just, it, it's more like a wish anyway. I think mm. uh, Architect has been okay. able to rejoin us. Um, architect, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I oh, hope okay. you can hear me as well. So okay. briefly, your, your thoughts on the fact that they're saying six states uh, will experience, will worsen the situation, the economic situation will worsen and the insecurity also will worsen in six states out of 36 in Nigeria by next year? I, I don't think we need the World Bank to tell us that. I think it, it goes without saying. Hmm. I want to ask one question. See, today in this program, I want to be able to make one, two, three very decisive, you know, comments. Insecurity. While I give credit to the honest soldiers in the field, we must interrogate the statement of the Sultan of Sokoto mm. when he said, why are these insurgents, these people, always a step ahead of the military? Mm. Now, this is coming from somebody who is not a nobody. Check his background in the military. And 
Question number one is, can these terrorists have better intel mm. than the military of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Two, can they have more sophisticated weapons than the military of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Three, what is our internal situation like that? Is there any part of Nigeria that we cannot access within two hours from strategic locations that have been mapped in the country and placed by technology and drones that within an hour as a state policy of anything happening anywhere, a drone must be able to get there. Let that drone, at the very least, monitor the movement. And there's, there's a program I did for the last National Assembly. I call it the National Eye. The Nigerian state security should be able to see any and every part, every inch of this country. I mapped it as somebody wanted to be the governor of the state. I mapped that quite well myself. And I can make that available. We are within 30 minutes. There is a drone in any location. Now, the, 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 these, these evil people are the most fearful people on earth. When they know they can be seen, they can be tracked, they will cool down. So the number one, let the Nigerian state, the military, set up the national eye. I can give them the template so that any part of this state in this country can be Monitor can be tracked. I'm not talking of cloud now. I'm talking physically within Nigeria. Mm. Can be tracked within two hours. Now an hour of flight takes me from Uyo to Abuja. Mm. Less than an hour from Abuja takes me to Lagos. Less than an hour takes me from Lagos to Kano. So why can't I have a base that nobody knows, an intel base, strictly ICT? at least in every senatorial district, that is only 109, 109. Even if it takes me a billion, which is, which is horrendous, to set up that uh, institution in every senatorial district, that is 109 billion. That is nothing to the, what we lose on a daily basis. Mr. President is going to look for investors. He should stop going to look for investors. You should come home, lock down, and make sure that every way is secure. When that is done, and people outside know Nigeria is so secure, they will start coming. So for me, that national eye product, product or project is the most important. When we do that, people will start to know that if they go to raid anywhere, they will be seen, they will be tracked to where they are going to end, and as a result, it's difficult for you to carry out such a massive operation within an hour or two. It's difficult. In that of plateau, it took them two days of operation. And the Nigerians said, what we're doing now is going to visit the families of the people. And that has become our ritual. But okay. Well, okay. Um, let's, let's move to another, another yeah. paper. Let's move over to The Guardian. Oh, the Guardian is the yeah. There's one I'd like to take here. This is coming from Rivers State, and it says, Rivers Elders write to Nubu Fubara on illegality of peace pact. I'm sure you've seen about an eight-point agenda on the peace pact um, where, well, they said... Fubara, you know, um, the, the 27 people who are decamped from PDP to APC, they still have to remain. Um, there are lots in that. Now, the Rivers Elders are talking about the illegality of the peace pact. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's a threat to democracy? Do you think it's illegal? Rivers, yes, go on. The Rivers people and elders are over embarrassing their government. Hmm. One of their elders came out to call him a political neophyte. Others are coming up to tell him that what he wrote, he signed, was nonsense. That's not the way to treat a king. It's not. You know, even when the king dances naked, you have two options. 
One is to tell him how stupid and foolish he is. The second is to go and dance around him with rapper, mm -hmm. where it seems that we are all dancing, that yeah. you are covering the Cover, king yes. until the king is clothed. Mr. Fubara has signed a document. I said it before on this session, and I say it again. Mr. Fubara needs strategic thinkers, wise men and women, a handful of them, to bring politicians. I don't want to use because sometimes I'm called a politician myself, though I call myself a professional in politics and not a politician. Mm. The politicians, you need to understand their mindset. They don't care about you. They don't care about you. So what they are doing is grandstanding and hoping that they are, you know, impressing you. They, they are actually, in, in secondary school, we used to say, de shining, you know. They are actually de shining you. They are actually embarrassing you. They are actually making you feel, feel, you know, if K is not taken, if Mr. Fubara loses confidence in himself, it's going to be terrible for River State. So let this elder go to him privately and hold meetings. We are, you know, they say it is where it is, what it is. We are here. How do we move from here? It is them that will set up a strategic think tank and committee on how to execute this. Thing. They can go ahead and bring one small boy, you know, in court and say, go to court, say, I don't agree, this and that. And then when he comes up that way, then the man will say, well, it's, it's a court decision and we must be law abiding. Then now you instigate the court decision from the beginning in a way that you don't look bad. Please, strategy is what wins every battle. And please, let us buy into Ms. Obrongi to attack cerebral governance. Mm. We are doing too much of political governance and it's not helping. Okay, um, we, we'll, move, we'll move to the Daily Trust now. There's a headline there, also political. Edo 2024, Basaki slashes Shrebu's budget. Deputy Governor insists on competency. Um, you, you touched a little bit about issues like these on uh, the principal and his deputy all the time, and there should be definite things that uh, should be in the Constitution and all that. But low-hanging fruits, what is happening in Edo State? What are your comments? You see, let me tell you, with all these things, if I had opportunity to sit down with Mr. Basaki, he is making himself to start to look weak. So all these things he's doing, let me tell you something. If you slash somebody's budget, it becomes public knowledge, and you make demand to gain public sympathy, the public always goes for the weak. Increase his budget, and then don't release it. So the body, <laughs> as Gloria has said, is public defense. <laughs> you know, the first thing is that, ah, obviously if they try, you'll see now, he's not increasing budget. Uh-uh. Why this man see they talk like this? See, the obviously they try for him. Um, uh-uh. What is it? But, you know, there's a difference between what is in the budget and what is cash back and what is released. It's, I mean, it's simple thinking. Mr. Obasaki is a very cerebral man. He's somebody I have a lot of respect for, including the person that they have chosen to succeed him. People may not like it politics-wise, but I've sat down and studied at the risk of campaigning for anybody. He go, he go down low. Like, like, like Akata himself, Akata is a nice guy. But these are people that are bringing something to governance. So what he should do is allow his deputy to compete with what you call, you know, superior, you know, argument. Let, let, let the campaign in a door state be a campaign of ideas, capacities. Let the professionals come in and put Mr. Uh, uh, Igodalo, put Mr. Afata, put uh, the current deputy governor, put three of them on the pedestal. Let them start to argue governance and, you know, at the stage you discover that somebody will discover that the broad uh, this is not be policies that governance, so maybe I, maybe I should cool down. But all these ones of trying to fight your deputy publicly, you are only making the guy to become, you know, more popular. And when the sympathy starts to swing on his side, he can leave your party, go to another party as it is now. And you would have given him, you know, 
you can take the wind off his sail. If I'm asking you to send for me, let me spend what he thinks with me. At the end, whatever he wants as a governor, you get it. Genius. Yeah, you are a governor. <laughs> Oh, he is evil genius that, that will tell him all the things to be a political Maradona with. Uh, but mm -hmm. that I don't know. But I think I, I like what uh, Mr. Zikel has said, talking about the, the um, deputy governor not being able to contest, because I think that's, that's even yeah. the, the root cause of the whole issue happening in Edo State at the moment. Obas, um, Shaibo has his political ambition to become governor in the next cycle. You, you know, the, one of the things that happened here is that the deputy will see all the things that you have been doing mm -hmm. and there's always this fear that if he's not exactly on your, in your camp, mm -hmm. he might expose the kind of things that you... because he mm -hmm. knows everything yes, uh, that you've been doing. So a lot of them are afraid, which mm -hmm. means, like he said, um, it's no longer like you choose the person you're comfortable with. Are, the people are imposed on you so that they can be the ones to succeed you. Mm -hmm. Because if I bring someone I trust, no matter what I do, uh, there's no fear that when yeah. I leave, he's going to probe me and do all the, mm -hmm. the things that are, are not very good to me. True. True. Well, do we drop it here? Um, well, I think we can, we can take one more. And okay. this is coming from the Daily Independent. It's a small headline here on the top. It says, we're working to turn around Nigeria's economic fortunes. And this is coming from Tinubu. We're seeing the World Bank saying that insecurity and economic hardship will worsen. But the president here is saying we're working to turn around Nigeria's economic fortunes. I miss mean, more borrowing. Mm, mm, more mm -hmm. borrowing. That's right. Is this something that we're going to see in 2024? From your own standpoint, um, all that has happened here in the first few months of um, the Tinubu-led administration, is this something that you can confidently say, yes, might happen and the fortunes or our economy might just be shining brightly? Economy is not wishful thinking. Mm. Economy is being more productive mm -hmm. based on peace and stability, based on macro microeconomic policies of state, based on the rule of law being the decider and the confidence giver to every investor. Please tell me, number one, your policy on the judiciary to ensure that I, as an investor coming to your country, I know that if I am half done, I will get justice. Tell me that. Number two, tell me the specific policy on the, the insecurity. Very specific and definite so that I can tell in confidence that when I come, I will be safe. Number three. Tell me the strategic move of the country to move into being productive mm. economy. Very deliberate and very intentional. Number four, tell me the monetary policy of the state that tells me that I will exchange one naira for this amount of money in the next 12 months, whatever it takes. That stability in your I find I'm, I'm a real estate person. I'm developing a major estate. People are bringing foreign funds to me. I'm afraid to take because I take, say, $2 million today, expecting that even at 1000 that I'm going to return $200 million naira. I look at my sales profile, and I know that I can raise that $200 million naira within the six months that I've talked about. At the end of the six months, I raised the 200 million naira. But guess what? The 200 million naira does not give me $2 million. It only gives me $1.5 million because exchange rate has gone to 1,500. What do I do? I cannot increase my, my, my cost because I will not be able to sell. All my analysis are, 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 are scuttled. But if I know that I'm taking $2 million now, and that in six months, if I raise 500 or 200 million naira, 
I'll be able to repay the two million dollars I've got. I can now tell them bring the funds. Except I'm a speculator and I'm an adventurist and I'm too old to do that. This is not the time that I'm going to start running away from banks and then they will start seizing my property because the exchange rate has gone beyond what I anticipated. Look at when these people came into office about six months. In real estate, you don't think of three months, don't think of six months, you think of five years, ten years. Imagine what happened to my colleagues about five years ago when they collected with the Naira exchange for less than 600 Naira. Now the Naira has gone to 1,200. Mm -hmm. What do you think has happened to my colleagues? So don't tell me that the economy is going to be good. No, I don't want to hear that. Show me the fundamentals you have put in place. And on the basis of that, allow me to be the one to draw the conclusion. But as a president, you still owe the X factor which is the inspiring factor. But let your inspiration be an icing on the cake that is already there, mm -hmm. and not that the icing is what we look at. No, the cake is the substance. The icing is just what you can do without. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I mean, it's nice to inspire people and let them know that there's hope for Nigeria, but let it also be realistic as well. Let people be able to see it and say, this is where we are, this is where we're going to, and these are the plans that would get us to where we're going to. So I agree with you. Anyways, we want to thank you so much for joining the program this morning. Thank you for your valuable contributions. And have a lovely 2022. Yes, 24, 20, 23, right? yes. Please. Yeah, 1024, rather. It's there on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Wishing you, you a happy new year in advance, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. All right, we'll be speaking to Mr. Ezekiel Inya Etok. He's a public affairs analyst joining us from Akwaibom State. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our hot topic. Please stay with us. <laughs>